All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for um, joining us for this conversation about food supply chains. Hope you're enjoying the conference so far. Uh, I've noticed that there are a lot fewer people here than last year, um, which I think is a good thing. Um, there's a little bit more room to walk around and breathe. Um, but also the, the conversations have been, I think, a little bit more grounded in reality this year. That's just an observation so far. And I think that's a good, um, that, that makes this conversation sort of make sense in that, in that context. Um, my name is Mike Orcutt. I'm an editor at uh, MIT Technology Review, and I'll be the, the moderator today. Um, the title of this session is From Sea to Table, Live Projects in Food Provenance. Um, and there is, has been a ton of um, hype and marketing and PR sort of around this idea for several years. Um, and it, it might be, especially food supply chains, it might be sort of the biggest um, blockchain, not Bitcoin application um, in terms of the amount that it gets talked about um, out there. And sometimes it can make it difficult to know sort of what's real, like where is the rubber actually meeting the road. Um, so our panelists today are here to tell you guys that this is a real thing, it's solving real problems, and we're gonna dig into some of those real life examples. Um, so without further ado, I just wanted to start um, by having the panelists introduce themselves. And we'll start with um, Ramesh and go down the line. Uh, please tell us who you, who you are, what you do, a little bit about sort of your backstory, how you came to do the work that you're doing, um, and, and we'll go from there. Yep. So my name is Ramesh Gopinath. I'm with IBM, and I'm responsible for product management and engineering of a couple of our supply chain solutions that leverage blockchain. And my journey in this area started in 2015. Uh, I was in IBM Research looking at this technology, and we felt that this is a tremendous potential to transform many things. Somehow we got the senior management of the company excited by it. And a year later, we had a business unit focused in the space. And I, as part of that, stepped out and started working in supply chain solutions in particular. Worked with Walmart for the last two, two and a half, three years. That was the opening of you know, what led to the food trust work that you know, now has a much bigger ecosystem that we'll talk about more later. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kim Harrington, and I'm the Blockchain Center of Excellence leader for Bayer Crop Science. Um, and I uh, also came to blockchain just uh, several years ago, started learning about it personally. I actually just started learning about it at home, started out more on the software side, and then at one point decided I wanted to figure out how the hardware worked and started building mining machines and things like that. So at one point I had 18 of those in my basement. Um, but I think what was really useful about that was in the early days the biggest operating networks were the cryptocurrency networks in the public space. And so kind of figuring out and learning on those and figuring out how those were designed and then being able to adapt that to design decisions that you would make in enterprise I think was something I was really passionate about. So at one point, I uh, started to kind of bring it into business and start doing work for enterprise as well. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dave Checky. I work at uh, Cargill, which is a large agricultural company that no one's ever heard of, but that's OK. Uh, we, I work in a group, uh, our, our labs, our tech labs uh, organization, where we focus on uh, emerging tech and digital innovation. Uh, several years ago, like how we, how we came into blockchain, several years ago, uh, there's, we work with a bunch of uh, tech, tech savvy uh, tech people, and of course in the office with a bunch of engineers and developers, there's a couple of crypto freaks that are really into uh, alt currencies and so forth, and uh, that chatter happened and got really, uh, really vibrant and vital, and we then immediately started exploring like where would this type of technology uh, decentralization, disintermediation of markets really start to impact our enterprise uh, scenarios, which is a, a demonstrably different use case than uh, traditional like crypto-based use cases. And so we've, since that time, have been engineering and maturing, uh, giving back to the open source community where we can uh, to uh, bring capabilities that support enterprise use cases and then solving a, a, a portfolio of business-centric problems using that same technology. Cool. <clears throat> Let's uh, stay with Dave for now. Um, we're gonna go back down the line again just in reverse. Um, 
Could you share with us one or two or however many examples um, you'd like to share of some live projects that Cargill is working on? And as you explain these, can you tell us what specific problem it's solving um, and sort of explain sort of who the network participants would be in these cases and sort of why they would want to join the network to begin with? Yeah, great question. Uh, so, I mean, fair question. It's the topic of the, of the speech here, right? So, the, uh, so uh, one probably our, our most uh, publicly visible example of where we're using uh, a, a distributed ledger tech uh, in production, I guess, was the the quantifier there would be uh, in our in our Turkey supply chain in North America. So, uh, several years ago, two Thanksgivings ago, 2017, uh, we launched a, a product really with several purposes, and that product was providing end-to-end -end traceability for turkeys from the farm all the way through our processing and packaging facilities to a retail facility to an end, end customer. Uh, that actually hit in Thanksgiving. It was, it was uh, Thanksgiving 2017, which again was a very popular time for uh, distributed ledgers just in social circles. Uh, and so that was a very uh, ex exciting, dynamic time to be Tra tracing a, uh, a, uh, a food product on a blockchain. Uh, we've carried that pilot forward for several seasons now. We're planning what we call Turkey 3.0 uh, this year. It started just in Texas, and really the business problem it was solving was uh, traceable, provable, trustable uh, provenance of a, of a food product. Uh, we started in Texas uh, because people in Texas really like to eat turkeys that are grown in Texas, and the idea that we could tell the story of that food like helps the farmers and the producers but uh, so it really helps their livelihood because authentically they're doing really good work and raising these birds in, in really good ways. And it helps the end customer understand that they're buying things that are uh, grown and produced in, in that region. And that's been, uh, again, that's been really exciting as we, as we mature that. So the business problem fundamentally was how do we provide more trust and credibility in the market? How do we improve farmer livelihoods at the uh, uh, upstream in the supply chain? And then how do we communicate as a producer and an ag producer uh, with our uh, to tell the story of food uh, more effectively and efficiently with uh, with end customers. So that's that's one uh, real notable example. Um, I'm going to follow up real quick. So besides sort of consumer transparency um, as a as an outcome of this, as a positive outcome of, of Cargill's work in general, what are some what what are one or two other sort of goals uh, with 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 this blockchain um, development besides sort of consumer transparency? Yeah, that's great. Uh, I think. Like there's a number of them. First, I think is uh, what I'll call efficiency, which is a <laughs> like a fair term I think to use. But like uh, any any type of transactional environment where you're interacting with multiple parties uh, can be uh, inefficient. Uh, we we conduct uh, a, an atrocious amount of work uh, over the phone and emails uh, and uh, half baked EDI documents and so forth. And anything that we can do to integrate with our extended network of trading partners to be more efficient and effective with our data exchange uh, is certainly welcome. Uh, that doesn't mean to the, there was actually some really interesting points in the keynote today that uh, there's also the tremendous number of edge cases and we've really learned that, that uh, the, having post-it notes next to your phone really allows you to do a lot of uh, flexible things with your contract negotiations and so forth. And if you need to codify business rules and abide by them in a network or a group of uh, interoperating trading partners, like that creates maybe more rigidity in the market than, uh, than your existing business processes are used to. But that, that was one of the key, uh, the key drivers. And in fact, we're seeing that as emerge as a, uh, a very, very powerful force for further digitalization in our supply chains is efficiency, more so than transparency, although transparency is still great and is a top order thing. Uh, but uh, B2B transactional efficiency is a, uh, is a very powerful driver of value in, in enterprise use cases for us. <clears throat> so Kim, can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on at Bayer, um, give us some specific examples. And similar, um, just to reiterate, what, it, sort of what, the, what is the specific problem that it's solving, and how do you get network participants to join, and sort of why should they join to begin with? Yeah, so, so we also have some live deployments that are mostly focused on tracking and tracing of seeds. Um, so I think something that's unique about it is that traditionally, when we think about consumer transparency, the concept is really kind of that farm to fork idea. Um, and, and we really start before the farm. So, um, you know, we talk more about, 
you know, the, the seeds being produced, leaving our product supply organization, and then they go out into a field with growers, and then there's an entire process that happens that transforms that product into something that can be sold later on. Um, so, so that's essentially what we've done is tracking that process. And I, I, would, I would reiterate what Dave said around the fact that it really helps to get all of the parties that take, uh, take, have a part in that whole process to um, coordinate and participate more efficiently. There's a lot of handoffs in the process and there's a lot of systems that don't necessarily talk to each other. And there's things that happen during the process that get, gets lost. And um, particularly for seeds or products that are differentiated or that may have more value because you can prove provenance um, or that can be sold into new markets because you now have additional data or it's a, a, sp a specific type of product that's appropriate for one type of use versus another. Uh, the burden to collect that data can be quite high. So what we've been able to do using a blockchain-based system is really automate the collection of that information, make it more efficient for everyone, a uh, lot less error-prone, a lot less manual intervention, and, uh, and then of course everyone who needs to see the data to consume it for a downstream process has it in a much more efficient manner. Cool, just one follow-up. Could you maybe walk us through sort of how this experience occurs to a grower or what does a grower need to do in order to participate? Um, what do, what do, they, do they need to know how a blockchain works? I mean, sort of, what are, the, what, are, what are the barriers of entry here? Yes, so it is very important that everyone has ways of participating into the system, which doesn't always mean hosting a node or actually building your own blockchain infrastructure that you actually own. So from a grower's perspective, they just interact with the system through a web application, and they're actually using it in a, in a system that they're already familiar with. So uh, the actual idea that you might be interacting with or leveraging a blockchain-based technology um, may not be transparent to everyone. So you don't need to know how to, to do blockchain, let's say, mm -hmm. to interact with the system. And so I, I think that's also very important is thinking about the various participants that will be working inside of that process and who has the ability or the desire and the extra resources available to contribute on a technical level. And then where is it just appropriate that folks just interact with the system through a web application? So Ramesh, I know that IBM has a lot of stuff going on, so really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Yeah, so at IBM over the last three years, we've been working on a solution called IBM Food Trust, which, is, which gives participants in the food ecosystem from farmers to growers to packers all the way to retailers or food services companies a SaaS-like experience, if you will. But much of what happens in the system is what I would call trusted information sharing. You know, when we started, we felt that many of the problems in the food supply chain, if you will, whether it be food safety, food freshness, food, you know, uh, quality, waste, um, fraud, supply chain efficiencies, many of them can be solved significantly better if all the participants in that supply chain could share information. But that doesn't happen easily because of concerns about who owns the data, who can see the data, and so on and so forth. Confidentiality, privacy, and many, many other uh, you know, uh, concerns around data. So we felt that if we could use a technology layer like blockchain to sort of make companies comfortable sharing information, then we could do, solve all these problems. So that's where we started. And so much of what we've done is work with a group of companies to get a lot of the basic fundamental issues around governance, you know, data, you know, governance and so on and so forth, right? So it took us a while, and sometime in October last year, we said we are ready for prime time and announced IBM Food Trust as a SaaS product offering. So in terms of how companies join it and experience it, they, you know, most companies in the food supply chain think of all the way from farmer to the retailer, let's say. They would upload information around the things that they do with, say, lots of a specific food item, let's say. And the system then you know, uses it for sharing information based on the specific uh, data sharing um, you know, uh, that is permissioned by the owners who upload the data, right? 
So that's basically the crux of the system. So what have we done with the system? I'll give you a few examples of live things that are going on in the system. Today we have about 100 plus clients in the system. And let me give you examples of what some of them are doing. If you take Car4, for example, right? Large retailer, footprint in 30 plus countries. One of the key areas they wanted to focus on was giving consumer trust and transparency. So if you walk into a grocery store in Spain today and buy a specific uh, type of chicken, there'll be a QR code, you scan it, and that basically hits our system, and we surface information coming from multiple players in the supply chain that basically you know, makes the you know, uh, consumer more comfortable about you know, whether the chicken was you know, grown in an antibiotic-free environment and so on and so forth, right? So that's one key use case. It's been in production since November of last year. And just recently, uh, Carrefour and Nestle added you know, another product to this mix, which is muslin brand of uh, mashed potatoes. So that's consumer trust and transparency. And I just want to register one quick thought there. There are three key ideas behind it, three types of use cases. One is marketing, of course. Somebody wanted to sell better. The other is fraud. I want to know that the food I, you know, I'm you know, getting is you know, truly organic, for example. Or it could be, uh, you know, uh, think of shrimp, right? Sustainable shrimp. Sustainability is another reason why consumers want to know what's going on. So that's one class of solutions that we can solve with this food trust uh, solution we've built. Another is think of supply chain efficiencies broadly. Here we are working with Golden State Foods, who is a manufacturer of, of various items that go to food service companies, including fresh beef patties that they service restaurants with. What problem they wanted to solve in our system is sharing information to uh, reduce waste, increase freshness that's delivered to the end client, and overall make sure that if some product has got temperatures, is subject to temperature stress, you rush it through the supply chain to get it in the hands of the consumer so that you don't waste it, right? That's the problem they wanted to solve with our system. And harder problem in the sense you have to instrument it with you know, IoT sensors and temperature sensors. And that's basically another thing that we did, which we ran it live with five restaurants, you know, and this manufacturing facility. And that is also, you know, at a state where we're trying to scale this. So this, I would call it the supply chain use case, freshness, waste, and so on and so forth. A third, we are working with Walmart. Some of you may already know. Walmart has it had, had mandated as of last September, by September this year, all of its leafy green suppliers. Think of all the romaine lettuce incidents we had last year, right? The entire supply chain going all the way back to the farm or on food trust. What it means is, if all goes well, post-September, if there's an issue related to, say, a romaine lettuce this year, in November, you should be able, at least Walmart should be able to pinpoint and do surgical recalls, right? So that's powerful. Those are some three examples I want to say in terms of actual, you know, system, you know uh, actually what companies are trying to do uh, in production with our system. So now that you've had those projects running for a little while, what are, what are some of the most important sort of practical lessons that you've, that you've learned? So I think I would put it into a couple of buckets. One is technological and other is everything else. Everything else is a much bigger bucket than the other one. But let's start with technology. One of the first things, you know, uh, it's not so much about details of blockchain that basically is a worry. It's more about how do you ensure that, you know, the data that's relevant to you know, solving the various problems I mentioned. How do you ensure that the data is available in the internal systems of the companies, ensuring that they are sent to our system? That's hard, onboarding as we call it, right? That is a key challenge. We've done a lot of work in the space with tools to reduce the cost and reduce the time it takes to do that. So onboarding is one challenge. The other is everything to do with you know, the, um, um, the, let's go to the second bucket, which is the bigger one, right? Everything to do with concerns around how is data handled. That's very hard. And basically, this is not just about whose permission to see what, but what can happen with the data. So for example, if Walmart can see data about, from all its suppliers in the supply chain because they have permission Walmart to see it, does that mean that Walmart can do whatever it wants with the data? Sure, it can do things internally for improving its supply chain efficiencies or whatever, but they can't sell the data or share the data. These are the kinds of things that the only way I know how to do this is sit down in a room or in a call with people to figure it out. You've got to have those conversations. It, you know, and those are the harder challenges in my view. Technology challenges are still there, but they're relatively easy, and there's plenty more to be done in that space, don't get me wrong. But the bigger challenges are political willingness of people to get together and collaborate to solve these hard problems. And that takes a lot of hard work. Interesting. 
All right, so we're going to switch gears um, a little bit. Sort of the, the, the technologies and projects that we've been talking about so far, I mean, that we've been talking about on stage are several degrees removed from Bitcoin and other uh, blockchain networks. Um, businesses are using these things, requiring permission and so on, and it's sort of a far cry from the sort of anti-establishment ethos that you might hear about in some of the other um, conference rooms. Um, but we're at a cryptocurrency conference after all. So, uh, I mean, the extremely cynical view that I hear a lot as a reporter is that, that these aren't actually blockchains, that, that we're not talking about blockchains anymore, and that the word blockchain is being attached to these projects for marketing purposes. Um, I just want to, I want to start with Dave. I want to give the, the participants a chance to push back on that. Um, I also have a specific question. Um, so sort of what are the crucial aspects of Bitcoin and public networks that are preserved in, in this context, if yeah. that makes sense? Yeah, so <clears throat> I think there's a lot of uh, fairness in the assessment that there's maybe uh, labeling or marketing behind some of this stuff, but I do think there's a lot of authenticity in, in the true enterprise blockchain sense. And uh, I, I also think that like in most corporate settings, like no one understands what a blockchain is anyway, and so if you call it a blockchain, like if that works to build momentum towards solving a business problem, like that's a huge win in a lot of senses. So uh, we are using true, uh, true uh, blockchains in some use cases. I think the implications of true blo blockchains being uh, permissionless, for example, or like open and public, create a lot of challenges in a traditional business context. People generally like really like the idea of using a blockchain until they find out that other people can see their data and then they don't like it anymore, and so then we find other things to do. Cargill is still very, uh, we're still very uh, enamored, maybe is the right word, with the idea of distributed ledgers, which it doesn't have to be a blockchain, but we can still achieve very, very similar types of uh, multi-party transactions in ways that are distributed across groups or small networks of groups uh, that aren't necessarily built on blocks or blockchains, and so that's a really uh, interesting potential use case for us. Uh, we do use some pure blockchains, uh, however, and uh, you know, public networks uh, we, we've, we've tended to shy away from. I know there's tons of uh, momentum and gravity towards them, and I'm not saying that anybody really knows where any of this stuff is going to end, uh, but we, we've tended to uh, like to control how we trade and interact with our markets and networks and really try to pursue the platforms that we're using to build those uh, in, in ways that work along uh, our principles, which would be uh, of openness and transparency uh, and uh, trans uh, open governance and those types of things as well. Kim, how would you, how would you field that, that question? I mean, I, I really do think that we are leveraging the, the pure concept of what blockchain is. I just think that there are a lot of other pieces to the puzzle that we have to solve for in an enterprise context. So in businesses, there's a lot of complex business processes that we have to figure out how to digitize effectively so we can leverage the new capability that blockchain brings. And what I will say is that the smaller portion of your actual technical solution is probably the actual blockchain piece. <laughs> And then you have to figure out exactly, you know, how you can most efficiently store and search and call up and manage data so you don't drag your system performance down. How do you, and you may encounter business processes too that haven't effectively been digitized in the past. So then you have to go through maybe business process mapping or value stream mapping and, you know, all of these other things that you would have had to do for a normal, uh, you know, project digitization but now we're kind of pushing it forward under this new context of blockchain. But I, th I think the pure concept is there. There's just a lot of other things that we have to solve for as part of a complete solution that works for enterprise. Yeah, right. Like we, one of the analogies we use a lot is uh, in big companies, it can be really hard to deploy an ERP. You have to get a whole bunch of different lines of business to agree on how a process is going to work and how data is going to be structured. So imagine trying to deploy uh, an ERP to your uh, industry like getting all of your competition in a room and aligning on what the business logic and shape of the data is going to be like. That's an incredibly, incredibly difficult problem. And the problem, uh, to Raj's points, is, or to Ramesh's points, is not, the, uh, is not the tech, per se. It's the conversations and the design work and the, right. the process mapping and so forth. Right. So we only have, we have just, just under a minute left. I'm going to let Ramesh sort of bring us home. How would you feel this question about sort of public networks and versus what IBM is working on? Yeah, so essentially, if you look at a solution like Food Trust, where 80% of the time is spent on all the things that are needed to make 
you know, this, this information sharing platform work. The technology layer itself for me is very simple. It has to basically provide a few properties, and that's all I care about. Whether you call it a blockchain or a distributed ledger or something else, it doesn't matter. And those properties are fairly straightforward, right? I want to make sure that everything that comes in as digital signatures so non-repudiation is in place. That's a property. I want to make sure that the, the integrity of the ledgers you know, is decentralized. It's not in the control of any one party. And immutability is the third piece, and that's basically it. The rest of it essentially, you know, uh, and the fact that it's inspired by Bitcoin or whatever is totally irrelevant to me. It's more about these properties. If any database, for that matter, has it, I would use it for building a full trust solution. Cool. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, but I wanted to thank the panelists for your time. And can you give them a round of applause, please? <clears throat> Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.